Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming uh, and joining us here tonight. My name is Steve Cohen. I'm the executive director of the Earth Institute and a professor in the practice of public affairs at the School of International and Public Affairs. Tonight, we are celebrating the recent release of The Big Ratchet by Professor Ruth DeFries. Dr. DeFries is the Denning Family Professor of Sustainable Development in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology here at Columbia University, a position that she's held since 2008. Ruth has had an invaluable role in the development of educational programs here at Columbia since her arrival, including serving as the chair of E3B and the co-director of the undergraduate programs we have here in sustainable development in the Earth Institute. Uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Shahid Naeem and his colleagues in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology for recruiting Ruth to Columbia, where she has been a key member of the Earth Institute community. Professor DeFries' expertise lies in tracking the world's demand for food uh, and other resources and how those uh, demands are changing the planet. She earned her PhD in geography and environmental engineering at Johns Hopkins University and a BA from Washington University in St. Louis. DeFries was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, one of the country's highest scientific honors, received the MacArthur Genius Award, and so she is a genius in case you're wondering, and is the recipient of many other honors for her scientific research. In addition to the publication of over 100 scientific papers, she has previously co-authored the popular book, One Earth, One Future. Her most recent publication, in case you're wondering, is called The Big Ratchet, and it was inspired by several decades of observing the per pervasive footprint of humanity on the planet through satellite photography and research in the Amazon, Africa, and in Asia. It is an expert story of humanity, how people devise the ways to feed civilization and the technologies and innovations that allowed us to do so. The, what I really enjoyed about the book when I read it was Ruth DeFries's faith in humanity and in humanity's ingenuity. And since he's just arrived, I want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Denning for his uh, and his family's generous donations uh, that allowed us to establish the chair that brought Ruth here and has also helped uh, send many of our sustainable development students traveling around the world to learn about uh, the science of ecology. Now, following her talk, Ruth will take questions from the audience. And I want to ask people, uh, when they're asking these questions, to make them questions instead of comments and speeches, because I'd really like to hear from Ruth and her perspective. And I'm sure the rest of the audience would like to hear from her and her perspective. That's why everybody came here. So if you happen to start getting an urge to give a speech, uh, we have a sundial on College Walk. Uh, that's the traditional location for those, and I urge you to go there. Uh, but here, questions for Professor DeFries will be welcomed. And then uh, we've set up the terrace outside here uh, with drinks. It turns out it's a beautiful day, and uh, Ruth will be here signing books and selling them, I believe, right? Signing and selling books. And uh, then the rest of us will out, be out there drinking wine and beer and having a good time at Ruth's expense. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ruth DeFries. Thank you, Steve, for that very generous introduction. How's that? Uh, and thank all of you for coming. This is a great turnout, and I know it's a very, very busy week. So what I thought I'd do is just spend about 30 minutes or so giving you the overarching story of the book, and then look forward to your questions, and very much look forward to uh, enjoying the outdoors and the bar. So I've been squinting down at satellite pictures looking at the Earth for a couple of decades now. And one characteristic is abundantly clear. We humans, our single species, dominates the planet. We see wherever we look down from airplane windows or Google Earth, we see the imprint of our species. We see farms, roads, 
fields, cities. We are the dominant species on this planet. And when people take note of our dominance on the planet, there's typically one of two kinds of reactions. One is to note that we do dominate the planet and that is hubris and we're headed for disaster and we're destroying nature and we're going to have a catastrophe because of our destruction of nature. That's one view. Another view might be that we're an ingenious species, we always figure out a solution, we have nothing to worry about, technology is always there to the rescue. So these are the two extremes that appear in the popular debate about our domination on the planet. And I really wrote this book because I don't think either of those extremes are particularly useful. They don't provide us with any guidance of how to go forward if, in fact, we are headed for catastrophe and there's a doomsday, why would we work so hard at the Earth Institute to make things better? On the other hand, the assumption that technology will always get us out of our problems is unrealistic as well. So what I wanted to do was to take a more nuanced look at this question about our domination of the planet and I did this by stepping way back in time and asking the question, how did we get to this state? How did we get to be the species that dominates the planet? Can we see any pattern? Can we see any guidance for the future by taking this long lens back on our domination of the planet? So we have not, our species, Homo sapiens, has not been on this planet very long compared to many of our human ancestors. Uh, all of them went extinct for one reason or another, and we are the single species now, Homo sapiens, and uh, in that short time, in our short tenure on the planet, we have achieved this incredible domination that none of the other species in the hominid line have been able to achieve. So what, what made that happen? And there are many, could be many answers to that, but the perspective that I take on that question is that it's really all about food. It's about how we have figured out how to manipulate nature to produce more and more food that can support more and more people. So right now, at this point in history, it's about half of the land surface of the Earth is producing food for our one single species uh, in one way or the other growing different crops or feeding livestock. So we have really commandeered nature to, to feed us. So how did we get that way? That's the big question that this book tries to answer. But we can't answer that question without recognizing the amazing planet that we live on that makes it all possible, that provides the platform for us to manipulate. So we, ha we live on a planet that has features that make it habitable, and we've found so far no other planet that is habitable like the one that we live on. We have a, a variety of different characteristics, serendipity characteristics, right distance from the sun, plate tectonics, and very importantly for this story about manipulating nature to produce food, the ability, the planetary machinery to recycle the important elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, all of these elements that are essential for, uh, for life. So there's a whole chapter in the book that's devoted to this amazing, incredible, maybe not unique, but very special planet that we live on. But clearly that's not the answer alone. It's just, it's not only the amazing planet that makes it possible for us to dominate. Otherwise, we'd have all the other species. We'd be chimps and bonobos and other apes sitting in this room talking about this question, but it's not. It's us. So what is it about humans that makes it possible to figure out how to uh, manipulate nature? And there's another whole chapter in the book that's devoted to this question. What we have as a species is this incredible ingenuity, this ability to accumulate knowledge, to 
develop some kind of skill, some kind of knowledge, pass it on to our peers, pass it on to future generations who take that knowledge, improve upon it, pass it on to their peers, pass it on to future generations, and knowledge accumulates and grows and develops technologies that manipulate nature in more and more sophisticated ways. So we're certainly not the only species to learn, and we're certainly not the only clever species, but we are special in our ability to accumulate this uh, knowledge and build on knowledge from generation to generation. So most of our tenure, our 200,000 year tenure of our species on the planet, we were foraging for food and hunting and hunter-gatherers like many other species. And around 10 or 12,000 years ago, we took a very pivotal step and we joined a small cadre of other species who farm, who use other species, produce them intentionally to feed their societies. So leaf cutter ants, for example, some kinds of termites, some kinds of beetles, a, a very small number of species who figured out millions of years ago how to farm. So we are newcomers to, um, to learning how to farm. All of the species who farm have complex societies. All of those species have not reverted back to being um, hunters and gatherers. Uh, so we are now in that select group of farming species. So what did that do? That was a pivotal transition in the way that we interact with nature. When we transitioned to being farmers, population could grow because it was possible to grow more food on a smaller amount of, uh, of land. So population grew about five-fold. There was surplus food, which made it possible for people to live in settlements. It made it possible to have hierarchical and stratified societies. There were also a host of problems which came along with our transition to farming. Disease like smallpox and tuberculosis, which emerged from crowded conditions living with livestock. Our diets became worse. Our diets became starchier and less diverse. People became shorter, life expectancy declined. All of these ramifications from that very pivotal transition from being foragers to being farmers. A very big problem that was created in that transition was the one of uh, soil fertility. So once there are settled farmers growing crops and pulling the nutrients out of the soil, then the question is, how do, how, do we re, how do we mimic the natural recycling process to get those nutrients back into the soil? So civilization has been dealing with this problem that we created of soil fertility for some 10,000 years. So how did people figure a way around this problem? How do you take those nutrients that you're pulling out with each harvest and figure out a way to get them back into the soil so that you can grow the next crop. If not, the soil will lose its fertility and won't be able to produce enough food and that's the end of civilization. So how did we figure our way around that problem? The uh, ancient Chinese had an extremely sophisticated and successful way to deal with that problem. Uh, and that kept their civilization going for many centuries with dense populations and the largest cities in the world at the time. So what they did was they carried, figured out how to take the human waste, which is full of nutrients, from the cities and other kinds of waste and take it back to the countryside and use that to fertilize the soil. So I will leave it to your imagination what's in those buckets that those uh, gentlemen are carrying in the picture. But this was a solution. This was a way to mimic the natural recycling process. Uh, Victor Hugo in the 19th century, the French writer, had a quote about this. He said, 
Not a Chinese peasant goes to town without bringing back with him at two extremities of his bamboo pole two full buckets of what we designate as filth. Well, it was that filth that kept Chinese civilization going, as well as a plant-based diet. So this is what's euphemistically known as night soil, and it was the night men who collected that waste and brought it back to the fields. So this was also how fields were kept fertile outside of London, outside of New York. There were night men in New York. And this is a way that nutrients were cycled going into the Industrial Revolution. As cities grew bigger and bigger, it became less and less practical to collect all that waste and take it back to the countryside. So then we have another problem facing civilization. How are we going to do this? How are we going to get those nutrients back to the soil? So this was about when Reverend Malthus uh, was making his very famous predictions that we were headed for uh, calamity, that we would not be able to produce enough food to keep pace with uh, growth in population. So after a couple of years of drought and this problem with soil fertility, Malthus predicted uh, calamity, that there would be uh, famine. What Malthus couldn't see was all this series of pivots that were in store, all these ways that people figured out around this problem of soil fertility. So not long, a couple decades after uh, Malthus made these predictions, Alexander Humboldt, who was a German explorer, went to South America and he brought back bark and rocks and grass and leaves and all kinds of things back to Europe. One of the specimens that he brought back was, uh, was guano, bird guano, which collects in high piles off the... Uh, coast of South America on islands. It's a dry environment where the, there is abundance of birds and you can imagine the piles high of guano, bird poop, basically. What ensued from Humboldt's uh, taking that sample back to Europe was a booming trade. The Incas had known that this was a very valuable fertilizer, but what ensued was a commercial trade lots of money to be made, wars fought over bird poop, wars between Spain and uh, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. Bolivia ended up being a landlocked country. Uh, Peru had a booming economy for some time, which collapsed when inevitably that guano ran out. The birds could not replenish the supply to be able to compensate for how much was being taken out. So then we have other problems. Where is the fertilizer going to come from? So here we have a problem that we've created with settled farming. The, how are we going to keep soils fertile? There was a solution for a time, recycling the human waste. Another solution, bird poop. And then other solutions came into play as each one created a problem in its wake. For instance, bison bones. So as the settlers were moving across the North American prairie, they slaughtered the bison. So what was left was all the skulls and bones scattered across the prairie. So bones are rich in phosphorus, which is an important element for phosphorus. So for some time then, there was a cottage industry of people making a few dollars, picking up the bones, loading them on the trucks, sending them back east to make fertilizer. So these bison skulls and bones for some time were a solution to this problem of soil fertility. Again, another problem. Those bison bones, finite supply. They're all used up. So there's another problem. How are we going to solve that problem? It was in the early 20th century where there was a pivotal, transformative um, solution to this problem, which is still with us today, and that was to be able to synthesize nitrogen from the air. So the irony, one of the ironies of our planet is that the atmosphere is abundant in nitrogen gas, but that is not usable for life, it can't be used by plants, and then we can't eat those plants until that nitrogen is transformed into ammonia, which is done by 
uh, the microbes that we all depend on uh, to do that service. What was discovered by Fritz Haber in the early 20th century was a way to synthetically take that nitrogen gas from the air and convert it into uh, fertilizer. So this was pivotal because no longer was civilization tethered to these organic supplies, to human waste or uh, guano or bones, these organic sources of fertilizer, and we could rely on these synthesized chemical sources. This was a pivotal scientific discovery in the 19th century that plants don't need, don't necessarily need those organic sources to grow. They can get their nutrients just as well from rocks and salts and minerals. So that was a pivotal, pivotal transition. So here was another solution to the problem that was created. A, a big reason why that technology took, out, took off why it did was not because of its use for fertilizers, it was because that ammonia synthesized from nitrogen gas in the air is valuable for, was valuable for um, explosives as gunpowder. So in World War I, um, the Germans had this technology. When the war ended, the British couldn't quite figure out how the Germans were able to keep the war going so long with so many explosives. So after the war, the British went in to try to figure out what that technology was that the Germans were using. They couldn't quite figure it out from the, from the uh, factories that they were able to go into. So they ended up bribing a couple of German engineers to be able to get that technology. So here we have industrial espionage as another way that ratcheted up the amount of uh, food production. So then it became possible to produce sacks of fertilizers like we're so familiar with today. So now we have a way to fertilize through this synthetic chemical means as long as it was possible to, uh, to have the factories and purchase that fertilizer. Then we have another problem in its wake. So once you, we have the nutrients, then we can grow monocultures, we can increase yields, plants can grow a lot. So it's not only us who like the plants, it's the pests too. So there are insects and diseases and fungus and all kinds of pests uh, to deal with. So we've created another problem. And here we have another rather serendipitous solution. So DDT was a uh, substance that was rather obscure until it became a miracle for controlling the outbreaks of typhus and malaria during um, World War II. After the war, here we have this miracle drug, so it became a miracle solution to, uh, to agriculture. We can use that to control pests. Well, of course, it wasn't very many decades until the problem that was created with that solution, what came to the fore with the toxicity to wildlife and toxicity to people. Um, the, the solution to that, only a partial solution, we're still dealing with this problem, we'll always be dealing with these problems of pests, is um, pesticides that are less toxic. So here we have a way to control pests, we have a way to um, put more fertilizer onto the field, and then the problem came. So each of these solutions is creating another problem. So that's the pattern. A solution creates a problem, and then the problem leads to another solution. So the problem became then that once we can throw so much nutrients, fertilizer, onto the plants and kill the pests, those plants grow so tall that they fall over and ruin the crop. Sounds very simple, but it was actually a really big problem. The solution to that came with manipulation of genetics, which is where we started out 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, with dwarf genes that came from, um, came from Japan and plant breeding for plants that were shorter and more able to take advantage of those nutrients without falling over. So these are just some of the examples of the book, and what they illustrate is this cycle of problems and solutions, which creates more problems, which creates more solutions. So we're always in this cycle 
we're manipulating nature to such an extent, and that's what it takes to feed us, is a manipulation of nature, um, that we are inevitably going to create problems, and then our ingenuity devises some solution, which creates another problem. So that's the course of our civilization, is this cycle that we have always been in and we will always be in. What Malthus predicted, and we hear that a lot today, we hear a lot of sort of neo-Malthusian predictions that we are headed to calamity. So if you take the, the view from our current, a, a short view from the um, place where we currently are and linearly extrapolate out, it's easy to come to a conclusion of calamity and collapse. We often do that and it quite, when we have these problems, indeed it is quite, um, petrifying to think about the future. But when we look at this, when we step back and we look at this long arc of history, we see something very different and much more complex and much more nuanced than this kind of linear extrapolation. We see this cycle. We see a cycle of figuring out some way to manipulate nature, which ratchets up population. That inevitably runs into some kind of problem like a shortage or uh, toxicity like with DDT. So that's what's what I call the hatchet in this cycle. And then we figure out, we use our ingenuity or serendipity or some kind of way to come up with some other solution. And that's the pivot. And that solution will again ratchet up and create another cycle of hatchets and um, ratchets. So what we see from these different stories that play out in the book is that these pivots and these ratchets and these hatchets come from all kinds of different reasons, all kinds of dimensions, some serendipity, some quirky accidents, some intentional, but almost all none that we could really foresee if we were trying to project out into the future. So we have industrial espionage, we have repurposed war technology, we have obscure scientific discoveries, we have all kinds of different reasons why these technologies and pivots developed over time. My favorite quirky story in the book is the one of the Rocky Mountain locust, which I don't think I have time to tell you here, but you can read about it in the book, the reason that we don't have um, locust plagues like we have in many parts of the world, which are absolutely devastating to farmers and to crops, is completely accidental, is completely quirky. And think back to Little House on the Prairie where there were locust plagues that sent pot ingles back east because um, the crop was destroyed. We don't have that anymore. And I'll leave it up to you to, uh, to read about that, but it's a really, really interesting, quirky, weird um, story. So what's the result of all of this? We have this cycle of crisis and growth and ratchets and hatchets and pivots and all of these ways to manipulate nature accumulating over time and our ingenuity builds on that and accumulates even more. Where does that leave us today? So what's happened in the last 50 years is really amazing. All of these different ways of manipulating nature have collided and come together. Irrigation, pesticides, fertilizers, uh, synthetic fertilizer, um, manipulation of genetics. All of these ways we figured out how to manipulate nature have come together and led to what I call the big ratchet, which is the explosive growth in the production of food, the likes of which we have never seen in human history. So the, we, we all know that population exploded in the last 50 years, the amount of food produced increased even faster. So if we consider, if we were able to distribute all the food that's produced in the world evenly across all the people in the world, there would be more today than there was 50 years ago. Of course, that's not the case. Uh, that's one of the problems that we run into, that there are people without enough food. But it's an amazing feat, regardless of what you think of the outcome. It is just an incredible feat for a species which transitioned from being forager to farmer only 10,000 years ago. There's no other species uh, 
like us. So that brings us to the question of what makes, are we living in extraordinary times? And what makes our, our times different? One of the features of the current times that we live in is that we have this abundance, this abundant way to manipulate nature. And we've never had that before. So if we follow this pattern, and there's no reason why we think that we're not following this pattern of ratchets and hatchets and pivots, uh, we're, we're living the legacy of this big ratchet. We're at the crest of this big ratchet. And we're, we are now seeing these problems, these hatchets that fall out of this abundance. One of those hatchets is that we have unhealthy diets. We have an abundance of carbohydrates and less of foods that keep us healthy. We figured out how to produce so much corn and wheat and so on, but we haven't figured out how to have it let everyone have a healthy diet. We have epidemics of obesity and overweight that are spreading throughout the world, not just in the US and Europe, industrialized world, but throughout the developing world, this spread of obesity and, um, uh, and uh, overweight. So the state of the world today is that for every five people that don't have enough food or chronically hungry, there are eight people who are overweight, which is an incredible statistic. There are, the number of underweight people are declining, the number of overweight people are uh, increasing. But it's tragic in this world of abundance that we live in that we have anyone who is chronically hungry because there's enough food to um, feed everyone. So that's also one of the hatchets that we're living with. We haven't figured out as a species how to live with this abundance. We also have all of these environmental issues, which we work so much on in the Earth Institute, um, that comes out of this abundance, nitrogen runoff that leads to uh, pollution, like Toledo experienced with the recent toxic algal bloom, um, too much nitrogen to greenhouse gases. Agriculture is, contributes about a quarter of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, these, the, all of these environmental issues. So we are living in the time when these hatchets are falling from this abundance that we've created. But I think, and what I take hope from, is that we're starting to see the pivot. So this is the cycle. We have the problems, and then we pivot. We figure out the next solution. So we're starting to see those pivots in a um, slow but sure way. We're seeing a lot more attention to diets, to healthy diets, to how, how diets affect both the environment and our own health. That's something that is new and extremely important. We're starting to see a lot more thinking about the efficiency in the way that we use fertilizer, the efficiency in the way that we use um, water, a lot of attention to, to that. We're starting to see um, recycling, getting back to these old ways of mimicking the, uh, the natural recycling process. So we're starting to see these uh, pivots and that's, really what we focus on in the Earth Institute are these solutions which can, can lead to the next, um, the continuation of our success as a, as a species. So if we take this story, this long arc of history, this cycle of ratchets and hatchets and pivots and growth and crisis, we see a couple of things. We see that we are an incredibly ingenious species who has solved many, many problems. We also see that feeding civilization is a series of experiments. It's successes and failures, it's manipulating nature in one way or another. There's no end point, and there will never be an end point because we really are manipulating nature on a very grand scale. So we can look at this story and either take a pessimistic view or an optimistic view. From a pessimistic view, you could look at this and say, well, we're always vulnerable. We'll never be able to solve our problems. We will always be creating problems. And that is true. We are always in this cycle. We are always vulnerable. But I rather tend to look at this story in an optimistic lens and 
many of you may share that or you may not share that, but that's the way I interpret that, that we are ingenious, that we have lots of knowledge, we have more knowledge than we've ever had before, and with a lot of hard work and a lot of attention, we can continue this cycle of finding solutions to the problems that we create. So that's the, the story of the book, so I hope you enjoy it. I hope it gives you a new perspective and way of thinking about how we relate to uh, nature. I certainly had a lot of fun writing it, so I hope you have fun reading it. And before I end here, I do want to just sincerely thank so many people who are in this room and not in this room who made this book possible um, from, the, uh, from the literary agency, from basic books, and many of co your colleagues who are here who critiqued and argued, and that's always fun. That's what makes the Earth Institute so rich, is that we have deep intellectual exchange. We don't always agree, but it's always with respect. Um, the illustrator who drew these fun pictures, and most of all, there are a lot of students in this room. Thank you for coming, and you're really the, the, the reason for optimism. So thank you very much. Questions? We have a mic back here. Uh, one, of the, one of the results of this incredible transformation of the landscape that you talk about is uh, a loss of biodiversity across the planet. And I, I believe people like Edward Wilson have talked about uh, the possibility of an of a, of a, of a upcoming mass extinction to rival some of the ones in geologic history. Um, do you have any comments about that? What, what's a possible... Uh, Ratchet, what's a possible yeah. solution for this uh, threat? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. So genetic diversity is clearly one of the amazing features of our planet that is not only just amazing in its own right, but it's what creates the possibility for us to have that diversity to manipulate uh, in the first place. So clearly our imprint on the planet has displaced <laughs> many, many species, and indeed that's one of the pivots in the, uh, talked about in the book, to be able to uh, figure out how we, can, how we can produce the food that we need without um, taking up all of the land and ocean that is needed by other species. So there are some hopeful signs. It's, uh, one is that we are this is both a negative and a positive, there's always good and bad to every change, is that we are becoming an urban species. We are getting our food from grocery stores, like in that picture. We are, uh, in a couple of decades, we're gonna be about 80% of the world's population is gonna be in, living in cities, which is an amazing transformation. Probably as transformative as our transition from being forager to farmer in the way that we um, relate to nature. So on one hand, that's a proposition where we have to think, how do we create all this food? But on the other hand, it could be, could be an opportunity to leave more land for nature, for other species. And again, it's our choice. It's an opportunity and it's our choice whether we choose to, um, to take that. One perspective is that being now in the Anthropocene, that this time period is somehow different, that because we, we dominate the world, that uh, the same cycle would be somehow different. Do you share that, or what do you see there? Um, I think the pattern is the same in this pattern of ratchets and hatchets and pivots. I don't think that's different. What I do think is different is the nature of the hatchets that we're seeing now. So our problems are coming from abundance. Previously, they came from uh, shortage. We are able to affect um, 
global scale processes, we um, humans are equally or even more influential in the natural recycling processes than are the natural recycling processes themselves. So our ability to influence on a global scale is different and that abundance is different. But we also have more knowledge. We have more ability to spread that knowledge and to develop that knowledge. So I think the, the nature of the problems are different now, but I think that cycle is the same and that we are now living in this time when we are uh, looking for those, looking for those next pivots. This may sound like it comes from either a philosophical bent or, uh, but it's 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 uh, it's just a feeling. Um, to what extent, as you study the hatchets and the pivots, um, do you see that the hatchets are getting bigger and the pivots taking longer and the hatchets are falling more frequently as we innovate beyond what nature and equilibrium is sort of giving us. Have you observed any, any change over the course that you, of history that you studied? Mm, that's a very interesting question. Um, some of these pivots occurred in history really fast when there's a good idea or some kind of solution, whether it's a good idea or not happened really fast, like the guano trade. It wasn't long before Humboldt discovered guano and there was a booming trade. So, um, so these changes can happen fast. We live in such a globalized, interconnected world that there would be a strong argument that these hatchets are falling faster as well, but so is the growth of our, of our knowledge. I don't know if that's a... Full answer to your question. How would you use this understanding to prevent future wars based on uh, conflict being over uh, natural resources so many times? Oh, wow. Well, we know that there have been many wars fought over, oh, wars are often fought fought over resources, like the Guano Wars, um, uh, over the nutrients coming from bird excrement in uh, South America. Um, some people, there is uh, uh, some thinking that um, water, which is a very big issue, uh, where, where fresh water, where we'll get enough fresh water, um, has actually led to uh, cooperation. There is a, a line of thinking that, that because the water is so important, we can't live without it, that that has led to some conflicts for sure, but also um, cooperation where there would not be the cooperation if the resource were not so incredibly vital to everyone. So I don't know how you take this story and use it to prevent wars. I wish, you know, that would be wonderful if we could figure out how to prevent wars. I don't, um, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, hello, um, congratulations for, <laughs> for the, what you've been telling us and for your book. Um, I was thinking about, you talk about patterns, the patterns of pivots and problem cycle, and you talked some, a little bit about choices just before in the, in the previous question. And I was trying to, to think that, like, if it's always about choices that we make, or if you have some thoughts about how the psychology of human species works and, and why haven't we taken, like, choices that could actually make a cut in this kind of cycles. Yeah. Like these patterns more seem to me like sometimes that is a species like any other species that works in a, in a particular way. And sometimes humans maybe are the same. So I wanna know like what's your perspective in terms of choices and patterns? Yeah. So I think we, um, I think it's human nature <laughs> to um, react to crises and uh, 
to really get in gear when we have some crisis facing us. That's our short-term way that we generally operate um, in the world. Now that we have more knowledge about what the repercussions are of how we're manipulating the planet, can we have a longer-term view or does it always take a crisis to move to the next, uh, the next pivot? Um, I think there's a lot of evidence that we need crises or what looks like a crisis to be able to really get into action. Um, I think that's, that's a characteristic. Maybe it's changeable, um, but that seems to be the pattern, that the way we live. Um, do you think adaptation to crisis necessarily has to be technological improvement or um, continued exploitation of nature, or do you think there's some validity to the sort of back to nature, sort of permaculture and mixed agriculture movement that is going on right now in yeah. some smaller circles? Yeah. Um, so I think technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Technology exists within the society and the culture that, that, it's, that it's in. Um, so there isn't really anything that technology is completely separate from, the, um, from society. I do think, and I know some of you may differ with this, that we've ratcheted up so far that the prospect of um, supporting humanity on um, ways of producing food that served humanity for a long time um, aren't really going to do the job, especially being the urban species that we are now, feeding all those people in cities. Um, I don't think that can be done without relying on technologies and improved technologies from what we have now. While I'm all in favor of um, growing healthy food and eating local, all of those things, I think that, um, that we can't, we've gone too far to really go back to living that way as a species. What about the war between organic and NGO, uh, you know, the process that we're doing with Monsanto, for example? There is a big, in Europe, there is a big war against the genetic, uh, I mean, transforming food by genetic uh, process. Yes. Well, yes, we can't get through this evening without talking about genetically modified <laughs> organisms. And it's a really complex topic. And unfortunately, at this point, it's more, uh, the debate is more about ideology than it is based on evidence. So we've been manipulating genetics for 10,000 years, now we can do it in a molecular kind of way. That's not to say it's without its problems, but it's the same principle of manipulating um, genetics. So GMOs, clearly there's no silver bullet. There never will be a silver bullet in a technology that solves all problems to feeding civilization, and GMOs is the same. It's not a silver bullet. Um, maybe there can be some benefit from it, um, so I'm not opposed to GMOs in principle. There are some real issues that I'd love to talk to you about um, afterwards, but it's another way that we've figured out how to manipulate uh, genetics. And unfortunately, it's become so polarizing and so ideological. So I think we'll draw the questions to a close there, and I look forward to talking with you all and enjoying the lovely evening. Thank you.